I'm Jim Burnett of NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. During the sixth episode of our series on the history of space travel, we'll see the second half of the film, Friendship 7. During the last episode, we saw how astronaut Glenn prepared to take the first American orbital space flight around the Earth. The people of Project Mercury and the Worldwide Spacecraft Tracking Network prepared to do their jobs during the flight. We saw John Glenn enter his capsule called Friendship 7, and we saw him blast off successfully on February 20, 1962. We left him about to enter orbit, and things were looking good. Now let's pick up the film as Glenn's capsule is about to go into orbit. Seco, sustainer engine cutoff. The moment when the final Atlas engine will shut down. When Friendship 7 should separate from the booster rocket and begin orbital flight. Seco, lots of grades fired, okay. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. To John Glenn, now belongs an awesome panorama. The world curving beneath him, just as it was filmed from an earlier Mercury capsule. And I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Friendship 7, this is uh, Connell Capcom. I read 
you loud and clear? How do you read me? Over. Roger, K-9 loud and clear. Uh, Roger, loud and clear. Uh, what is your status? Over. So this is Friendship 7. My status is excellent. I feel fine. Over. Uh, Roger, I monitored part of your uh, transmission over Canary and heard your comments on the weather over Africa. We've had dusty weather here, and uh, as far as we can see, a lot of this part of Africa is covered with dust. Across Africa, races Friendship 7 at 17,545 miles an hour, 300 miles a minute, four miles for every heartbeat of John Glenn. Friendship 7 streaks through the night of tomorrow and races toward the dawn of yesterday. Above the Indian Ocean flashes Friendship 7, far beyond human sight, seen only by the electronic instruments of the coastal sentry as she records the lightning passage of the man in space. For John Glenn, the familiar time references of Earth no longer apply, for he journeys around our world in just 88 minutes, outracing the sun that needs 24 hours to circle the same globe. of signal. Wymus has lost contact and Friendship 7 streaks home, an unseen comet darting across the land of its origin. Canaveral contact, how do you copy over? Uh, Friendship 7 uh, to Canaveral, uh, read you loud and clear. How me over? Roger, Friendship 7, Canaveral contact, read loud and clear. Stand by the Capcom, please. Roger. Uh, Roger, still reading you. Uh, 7, this is 
Cape Cod to Bermuda now. Hey Roger, this is Friendship 7. Friendship 7, this is Bermuda Capcom. Hey Roger, this is Friendship 7. I'm controlling fly by wire present time. I have no uh, left jaw, low thrust. Minor trouble aboard Friendship 7. A malfunction in the automatic control system was causing the spacecraft to yaw in skid-like fashion, away from its proper flight attitude. But Glenn is overriding the faulty system and now manually controls Friendship 7 on fly-by-wire, directing its movements by hand control, much like a pilot flies a plane. Friendship 7, this is Kano Capcom standing by. Kano, Kano. Friendship 7, we have uh, telemetry solid and check all your systems out okay. Uh, we will remind you to start the uh, pre-dark side uh, checklist as soon as you lose contact with us. Hello, right, your Friendship 7. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is Muge Contact. Friendship 7, this is Muge Contact. Do read, over. Okay, this is Friendship 7, I'm me. Your friendship 7, we say Capcom. Uh, will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position? Over. Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center off position. All right, Roger. You haven't had any uh, banging noises or anything of this type at higher rates. Negative. All right, Roger. That's, they wanted this answer. Right. Masked behind that routine report, the first hint of potential disaster. It came when astronaut Cooper relayed a request from Mercury Control asking Glenn to check the status lights for the capsule's landing impact bag. Glenn reports, status normal. But ground stations are now receiving an ominous chilling signal, an indication that the heat shield on Friendship 7 seems to have come loose. Friendship 7, Hawaii contact. Hawaii, Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Hawaii Capcom. Uh, do you still consider yourself go for the next orbit? Affirmative. I am go for the next orbit. Roger, understand it. MCC confirms that they are go at the present time for third orbit. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is California Comtech. California Comtech, do you read? Over. Hello, California Comtech, Friendship 7, loud and clear, how me? Roger, Friendship 7, this is California Capcom. Where's your loud and clear, John? Uh, Roger, receiving you much better now, Wally. Uh, very good. Uh, uh, John, the Aeromeds are real happy with you. You look real good up there. All right, fine. Glad everything's working out. I feel real good, Wally. No problems at all. Good show. We're real pleased to let you goodbye this time. We'll see you next time around. This is Mercury Control. We now have a contact with our Guaymas, Mexico station and with the Corpus Christi, Texas tracking station. The Friendship 7 spacecraft is now committed to its third orbit. This is Mercury Control. In Mercury Control at Cape Canaveral, a decision must be made, and soon. The signal pulsing down from Friendship 7 indicates still that the heat shield is loose. Could the signal be erroneous? There is no way to tell. But if it's true, then John Glenn could perish in a searing inferno when he plunges back into the atmosphere. The retro rockets that slow the spacecraft and head it back toward Earth are strapped over the shield. If they were left on after retro fire, instead of being jettisoned as in normal reentry, then their straps might hold the shield in place before they burn off. They might possibly save Glenn from the 3,000 degrees of reentry heat until he's deep enough into the atmosphere for its force to hold the shield in place. But the decision must be made soon. Even now, Glenn is streaking toward the United States, and he must begin the retro sequence 300 miles west of California if he's to land in the planned recovery area 700 miles south and east of Florida. We'll give you the countdown uh, for retro sequence time, John. You're looking good. Uh, Roger, we only have five zero seconds to retrograde, over. Uh, that's a firm. I'll give you a mark. Uh, 45 mark. California, uh, California, this is Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. So keep, tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. 20 Please. seconds. Roger. Roger. 
Retros are firing. Oh, Roger, baby. Are they ever? It feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii. Don't do that. Do you want to go on the East Coast? Roger, fire retro light is green. Roger. Roger, retros have stopped. Uh, Hunter? I keep your retro pack on until you pass Texas. That's affirmative. Sean. That's a real, real good looking flight from uh, what we've seen. Yes, sir. Looks good, Wally. We'll see you back east. Right. Alright, boy. Texas Capcom Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Go ahead. Uh, we have decided to re enter with the pack on. This is Texas Capcom Freshman 7. We are recommending that you leave the retro package on through the entire re entry. This means that you will have to override the 05G switch, which is expected to occur at 0443. This also means that you will have to manually retract the scope. Do you read? Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over? Not at this time. This is the judgment of Cape Flight. Now, Roger, say again your instructions, please. Over. We are recommending that the retro package not, I say again, not be jettisoned. This means that you will have to override the 05G switch, which is expected to occur at 044353. This is approximately 4.5 minutes from now. This also means that you will have to retract the scope manually. Do you understand? Uh, Roger, understand. I will have to make a manual uh, 05G entry when it occurs and uh, bring the scope in uh, manually. Is that a firm? That is affirmative. Friendship 7. Uh, Roger. Friendship 7 is okay, sir. Go ahead, K, friend 7. I recommend you go to the wing to attitude and retract the scope manually at this time. Uh, Roger, retracting scope manually. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Uh, we see no difficulty at this time in that type of re-entry. Over. Uh, Roger. Understand. Contact with John Glenn and Friendship 7 is lost. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I think the uh, pack just let go. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read? This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. Uh, 7, this is Cape. Transmitting blind. Okay, Friendship 7, over. Uh, 7, this is Cape. Do you read, over? The furnace-like heat of re-entry has created a barrier of ionization around Friendship 7, holding all voice communication. Alone, he plunges back toward Earth, a fiery meteorite. Okay, Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Kate. Do you read, over? Okay, Friendship 7, do you receive, over? The thickening atmosphere breaks his descent, slowing Friendship 7 from 17,500 miles an hour to 1,300 miles an hour in slightly over three minutes.
and the forces of gravity slam against John Glenn until he weighs eight times his normal weight. Steelhead is the code name for the destroyer Noah, waiting to recover Friendship 7. But John Glenn cannot hear the message. Right around 443 flight. I was about on time. Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. Friendship 7, this is Cape. How do you read, over? All right, you're reading it loud and clear. How you doing? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. What is it? Is it break off? Is that correct? Uh, Roger. Altimeter off the peg indicating 80,000. Roger. Reading you loud and clear. Rocking quite a bit. I may still have some of that pack on. I can't damp it either. Going to throw early. It's a rocky first run. Uh, Drogue came out. Drogue is out. Roger, Drogue came out at 3,000 in about a 90 degree yaw. Roger, is the Drogue holding on? Roger, Drogue looks good. Roger. Scope did not come out. Roger, pumping the scope out. Stay again. Roger, re-entry checklist complete. Standing by for a minute at 10. Roger. Coming down on 10. Snorkels are open. in reef condition at 10,800 feet and beautiful shoot. Shoot looks good. On O2 emergency and the shoot looks very good. Ray of descent has gone to about 42 feet per second. The shoot looks very good. Hello Mercury Recovery, this is Friendship 7, do you receive? Roger, Steelhead. Uh, Friendship 7, the shoot looks very good. Over. Home is the Voyager. Behind, a journey of 81,000 miles. Through three days and three nights. In just four hours and 56 minutes. At 3.04 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friendship 7 comes to rest aboard the United States destroyer, Noah, and John Glenn returns to the people of Earth. A change of clothes, a breath of cool air, a short debriefing. Then, Glenn leaves the Noah, heading for the aircraft carrier Randolph, under the golden splendor of his fourth sunset of the day.
John Herschel Glenn, Jr. Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps. Married, father of two teenage children. Today, John Glenn and the Mercury team challenge space. And they won. will follow tomorrow, and in the tomorrows after that. That's the story of the United States' first orbital manned flight. Next time, we'll see a film which reviews the X-15 rocket plane and the planning for a lunar landing. Until then, this is Jim Burnett saying goodbye from NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Bye. <laughs>